Swift is one of the original, one of the two original projects that was that became OpenStack. OpenStack, you have compute, networking, and storage. We've covered block, Cinder. So the other part of storage in OpenStack is object storage. I did a quick teaser introduction this morning, uh, and now we'll get back into uh, Swift and object storage. So OpenStack Swift, uh, we claim it's the world's most popular object storage system. It powers large, large clouds, both private and public. It is a 100% uh, open source. It's an Apache 2 license. There's an ecosystem of tools and applications around Swift, both open source projects and also non-open source. Swift Stack uh, has a bunch of core developers on the project and also the PTL. Uh, John Dickinson uh, works for us. So to date, uh, this slide says 180 plus developers have contributed to the Swift code. Uh, I think the number is higher, uh, but I don't, I don't have another number to quote. Part of the contributors are, of course, Swift Stack, Red Hat, Box, uh, Intel is doing a lot of work on Swift currently, uh, of course, Rackspace, uh, and also HP. We had a question earlier this morning about who's, who's using Swift. So it's a logo slide, public clouds on one side, private deployments on the other side. Some of these logos are Swift Stack customers. Others are pure Swift open source clusters. We have um, Scott here. So he's here when I, when I point to him. <laughs> uh, so they're, they're using uh, Swift and Swift Stack. What seems to be an easy use case to, s to start with is to move uh, archives and backups. Right? If, you're, if you're an enterprise type organization, it's easy to get a, a, a commercially available, uh, open source available tool that can migrate data from, from being stored in, in file backends to object backends. Uh, Swift Stack has a product, uh, and so does eight or nine other companies. Uh, there is a file system gateway, so presenting a NFS on one side, uh, speaking Swift on the other. Uh, depending on use case, that's a very easy thing to do, right? So deploy your gateway, speaks NFS one way, uh, Swift the other, and you don't actually have to know you have object storage in the backend. If you have tools like NetBackup or Convolt, Simpana, or other backup tools, many of them speak Swift natively. So to do your long-term backups, instead of pointing them to a tape library, you point them to your Swift URL, and they, it's all transparent to the end user operator. Uh, another very common thing, of course, is for web assets. So I have images for a website. I need to store them. So instead of reading them from a disk, pulling them through your application web tier layer to an end user, just provide a URL, expose your Swift cluster publicly, and just embed the URL to the images in your, in your app server, and you take load and bandwidth off your, your compute here. Swift high-level architecture. Swift is a product. It is not a uh, collection of APIs to automate KVM, for instance. Uh, so Swift uh, can be run standalone from OpenStack. It can, of course, be run in OpenStack. But there's, there's a couple of pieces to Swift as, a, as software. Swift does not necessarily do uh, load balancing authentication. There are hooks in Swift for authentication, but there's not a production grade authentication as part of the Swift product. There is a proxy service that runs in Swift. It talks to the clients to handle and direct the requests inside a cluster. There's account container and object services in Swift, and they're responsible for object service. It stores object. It persists an object to disk. Uh, the container service manages your container databases and stores them to disk. Right? Same thing for account service, manages your account databases. Deeper down is replication and consistency services, which are other daemons running on your cluster, is this object still what it used to be? Is there bit rot here? Did I lose a drive? I need to hydrate, I need to replicate, I need to create more copies, I lost a node, a region, what have you. Uh, so that's separate from the other pieces of the cluster to provide performance even while replication is happening, right? So it's not the same thread, it's not the same software. Uh, can be run on separate servers, so you don't have to have proxy run on the same server as a container services, as the same server as object services, because it's purely software. And then, of course, all of this sits on standard hardware. We don't have a, a hardware compatibility list. So we run on x86 software or hardware. We run on Ubuntu, Red Hat, or CentOS. Um, 
anything that shows up as a block device in, in Red Hat can be a disk backend target for us. Cluster is a, a file system. Swift is an eventually consistent storage system. Given high latency and low bandwidth, depending on where you attach as a client to Swift, you could have a different, you get a different view of what the world looks like, right? I'm a cell phone in New York and I upload a picture and you're in Tokyo and you want to see that picture a second later, it might not be available to you, even though it's available in part of the cluster. My understanding of, of Gluster is that doesn't happen, right? It'll write lock you until the object is everywhere. So, so it doesn't scale as large because it has to, if you wait for consistency to, to work around the world, uh, you get a very low performance uh, file system. So Swift architecture, top layer, I'm a client, I'm an application, I talk to Swift. There's a few components, there's load balancing. So the URL I showed earlier, uh, to have any sort of both redundancy and, and have that scale out being parallel, you need a load balancer. Uh, you will flood your load balancer and you need many load balancers and you do round robin DNS to, to push traffic between load balancers, for instance. Uh, not part of Swift. There's a lot of good hardware appliance solutions and open source project like HA Proxy, where you can make very elegant uh, load balancing solutions, providing hundreds of gigabits of bandwidth throughput. Also, uh, to securing traffic, right, H SSL, HTTPS versus HTTP. If you want to pass credentials over a network, it's not part of Swift. So use something to terminate SSL outside of Swift. Swift stack provides a checkbox, enable SSL, give me your certificates. We deploy it automatically for you. Most load balancer brands can do SSL offloading. And then you need to authenticate your traffic, or most likely you do. We have customers that have network based authentication, so you don't have network access unless you're already authenticated. They do not do any authentication within Swift. 99 point something percent will do authentication for requests, or you know, it's a, a free for all storage system is not generally a good idea. The Swift stack come with Swift stack off. Uh, we come bundled with Keystone clients. So if you have an OpenStack deployment already, go on a GUI, provide your Keystone uh, endpoints, uh, we will authenticate to your Keystone environment. The web GUI is a Swift stack feature in, in our web management console. Uh, in Swift, it's command line configuration file, uh, add Keystone middleware to authenticate to a Keystone. Yeah, so the, the proxy is the HTTP endpoint for Swift. Proxy, so we think of it as the top tier, right? It's what talks to the clients, recommended, of course, uh, dedicated NICs sitting on a routed network to the outside world, protect traffic with SSL here. So it routes the requests from the clients to the disk, speaks HTTP one end, speaks internal Swift on the other end to pass objects into disks, uh, most often a separate node. Three replicas are simultaneously written. So once you talk to the proxy and you say HTTP put object, uh, the proxy is responsible for allocating three object nodes writing three copies of that object on the back end. It waits for Quorum to acknowledge that write. So once two, two of the nodes acknowledge saying I have two successful writes, the proxy turns around and tells the client I have the object, uh, you're done. Not saying that the third write would ever fail, uh, might just be one millisecond behind, uh, but the proxy saves that millisecond by acknowledging the write after two writes. If you're total replica count is three, which we'll get into later. Swift has ACLs on accounts and containers. So many users, many application servers can connect to an account um, based on ACLs. And then the containers in that account also have ACLs on them. Uh, it's the proxies that determines if the request, the URL you give the proxy, if you're authorized to do that with your credentials, it's done by the proxy. It's not done by the object storage nodes. Majority wins, right? So if your replica count is Three, two is quorum. If your replica count is four, three is quorum. You know, half, half plus one. It's configurable. So you, uh, by default, it's a three replica storage. More replicas can give you higher read bandwidth down the road, right? So if you write 10 replicas of an object, you have to now wait for 
six good copies to be written, so your write will be slower. You'll use a lot more hardware to store that data, but you can serve many more read requests later because you have so many dedicated copies of that object. The replica count is set on a container through a, through a storage policy. So a storage policy is a Swift ring mapped to containers on container creation. And anything that goes in that container will be bound by that replica count. A client sends a write request to the cluster. The proxy is determined based on network. Load balancer, DNS round robin will determine which proxy the client will land on outside of Swift. You touch one of the proxies. The write request goes simultaneously to three object nodes based on the URL name that you name your object. There's a calculation that goes on and they're predetermined which object nodes are selected. The proxy waits for two acknowledgements. They acknowledge back to the client at this point. On a read request, same network selection for which proxy you end up at. If your cluster spans the world, it's probably some geographic DNS load balancing on the very top layer. You get to a proxy that's close to you. You make a read request, the proxy determines, I know I have three copies, I know I have 10 copies. It picks one, one object node based on some historical performance, takes that, uh, makes a request to that object node, give me my object, passes it back to the client. Account container and object services. So accounts keep records of containers in them. So every account has a database and what's in that database is a list of the containers in the account, plus some metadata. Uh, they're SQLite databases, very durable. A container databases keeps the record of the objects in that container. So if you do a uh, container list saying, show me all the objects in this container, there's no crawling the cluster and figuring out what objects are on what servers. It's a, it's a database lookup, show me a list of the objects in this container, uh, given back to the client. An account database is a SQLite database file, right? So it's a file-based database. It's stored three ways in the, in the cluster. Um, so when you, for instance, write an object uh, into a container, that container database now has to be updated saying, I have yet another object in this database. Um, that's an asynchronous update to the database. The database lives in three places. They will all try to be updated at the same time if that fails for one of them, it doesn't matter. They can replicate on the background, on the back end, just like objects replicate. You can dedicate SSDs, you can dedicate servers, you can have all your accounts live in San Francisco and you can have all your objects live in New York if you want that network latency. For high transactional containers, definitely keep the container databases on SSD storage. It just financially makes sense and there's really no performance gain on breaking it out. But as your number of servers, number of objects grow, it makes more sense to, to separate them out because you can get benefits of having, I don't know, if you have hundreds of thousands of container databases now, you can start getting the benefits of caching the inodes of where those files are if they're dedicated servers with dedicated RAM. Uh, you, you do get performance benefits. You could have three SSDs in one node and those three SSDs is what provides container services. But then now you don't have re node redundancy. So uh, it's not hard and set rules. There's very good production implementation guidelines versus what can be done. The size of the container database is the length of the combined object names, right? So for every object name, how long is that name? How many digits is the size of the object? So if there's one byte objects, You'll use you know, one character versus if they're gigabyte, you need seven characters to represent the gigabyte or whatever, right? Or seven, zero, 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 zero. So, but it's very small, right? Uh, the ratio is, we say allocate one to 4%, but that's, you'll never run out of space if you do. To take that to extreme, right? If you have 100 byte objects that are 40 characters long in their name, you will have a way different ratio. But the beauty of Swift, too, is if, if when that happens, you can add four more SSDs, grow that storage pool for a container data specifically, and you now have more, more capacity without tearing anything down that you used to have, right? Uh, I mentioned it before, uh, metadata is stored with the data, 
So also triple replica on the same spindles as the data. There is no back-end replication, uh, slowing the overall system down. Swift can do chunking on the back-end. You can ask Swift to do chunking. So you can upload with a Swift client, and there's a lab later. I have a 10 meg file. I want to upload it in one meg chunks. Now on the back end, you'll actually have 11 objects, one manifest and 10 one meg chunks. The container, which you said upload my object into this container, that container contains the manifest. And each container will have a separate container mapped to it for the chunks of, of chunked objects in that container. So there will be two containers, one with all your data and one with all your manifest files. What, what if the replicas are returned? Immediately somebody's trying to access it from UK. Yeah. Can they be serviced? Yeah. Yes. Okay. If you do a, a, a container listing in the UK, you will not see that object However, if you know the name and get it, the cluster will traverse and get the object for you. So that's the other aspect of eventual consistency. So you can enable versioning on a per container level. So if you overwrite objects in this container, the old versions will be stored uh, in yet another, a separate, like it's a target container for old versions. You, you try to write an object. Yep. You say that you, you're going to make three copies of it. Yep. So, so your request, your write request, would you get a confirmation that it has been successfully done on, on that? Right? Uh, yeah, so after two, right? So after, after quorum, yeah. Okay, so, so it's confirmed. So you know that when you get a successful, you know that that's stored. Yeah. Okay. Yes. But, but on the other hand, you just don't know that, that it will be synced to multiple clusters and, you know, yeah. until later. And you don't know what that, that, that time is. No. Yeah. Okay. Replication and consistency. So it's constantly checking for replica status. Uh, it's not an on-read event. It is running in the background all the time, checking the state of every partition on every drive. If there's an inconsistency, a replication kicks in, it'll update the one copy that is either missing or is different. If it replaces a copy that is different, your source data of that object will be stored in a quarantine folder for you know, administrator inspection later. So we don't overwrite or lose any data. It'll say, what is my checksum for this collection of objects? It's not on a per object basis. What's my checksum for this collection of objects? And then he says, I know that this collection is also replicated on these two guys. He'll ask saying, what's your state? That's how they figure out if something is off, if replication needs to be kicked off and take place. So the replication, uh, so more, more answer to your question, right? So the, it checks the Swift partitions. It doesn't check the individual objects. It runs in the background to make sure uh, there are systems that runs on access, right, but not Swift, so it runs in the background. So on access, it's never checked. There's no master object. It will be served at the time of access. Um, so the partitions rolls up the hashes. They're quickly cons compared, right? It's very, very fast. Uh, and then if there's a mismatch, it spawns the thread and replication happens. Uh, currently, default in Swift is a rsync process that syncs uh, backend folders. Uh, there is a newer S-Sync process that is a Swift-specific sync um, that can be elected today. It's not default, uh, and it will be the default and standard and only option uh, sometime later this year, probably. You can also separate the, the replication to have a dedicated NIC, a dedicated network. So if replication happens, uh, it will not impact your uh, production cluster replication network, right? So you have a replication network for replicator, you have a cluster-facing network for proxy to object storage traffic, and you have a client-facing network, which is the third network to separate network traffic. The auditor is running on every single node, so there's no point of failure. There's no master process that'll stop in your cluster. Every node is responsible for checking the partitions he owns and ask the peers uh, if they're in sync. All these three nodes the auditor will run, they will ping each other saying, what's your checksum, what's my checksum? It is a distributed system with no single point of failure. Standard servers, standard hardware, SAT or SAS disks, no RAID. Swift does not RAID objects. Swift does not use LVM to span spindles. On the back end, Swift addresses a single spindle as a file system. It stores objects on those single spindles. Redundancy is done by placing full objects on multiple different spindles preferably in separate nodes, 
right? So uh, there's really no performance gains or redundancy gains to use rated storage in the backend. Uh, rather, on the other hand, it's a detriment because Swift has kernel log checkers and other smart checkers, right? If you have smart enabled drives uh, to predict failure and know what to do to route around that failure. Uh, if you have a RAID controller with a RAID LUN, much of those errors could be hidden from the OS and Swift can't take advantage of knowing what's happening to disks behind the RAID controller. In theory, a node can be up and running and participate in cluster activity even though every single drive is failed. If the only drive that's available is your OS drive, the node will still be available and participate. And that node knows that all my drives are failed. But the, the node will stay in the cluster until you as an operator takes it out. Swift is software runs on any hardware. It lowers total cost of ownership. If you started out on a certain hardware model, 2620 V2 a year ago, now you can get a 2620 V3. You get more performance out of a maybe a cheaper price, right? Put other CPUs in new object storage nodes. You don't have to rip out what you have today. Swift proxies will uh, direct traffic inside of your cluster to nodes that have more available performance at any given time. Right? So remember, no master object uh, on any read, it the proxy picked one object node to serve that request from, uh, that object node will be the one that has most available performance at that given time. Different hardware, different size hard drives, right? Next month, you'll have your eight terabyte drives. You don't have to grow a cluster because you started out with two terabyte spindles. You don't have to grow that cluster with two terabyte spindles for the life of the cluster. Put more, more drives, faster CPUs, slower CPUs, more RAM, less RAM. When you start seeing your use cases shift over time, maybe you want to add denser nodes, maybe you want to add faster, smaller nodes. It all, all works together. We are working to get eight terabyte drives into our lab right now because we have customers asking for them. We have not seen eight terabyte drives for anyone in production yet. But since Swift scales sideways and not based on the Individual performance of an individual spindle matters very little to Swift because it's a con high concurrency system. If you do chunking, most likely not guaranteed. So you have, a ob you have 30 nodes in your cluster. It's a perfect world, sun, sun shining. You say, I want 10, 10 chunks of my one object. There'll be one chunk of the three copies will be on all 30 nodes. If you have a node with 45 8 terabyte drives and you have a node with 10 2 terabyte drives no it's not always but that's also not a production deployment right so for for a well well architected system it will all be spread out so by doing chunking you can take advantage of faster reads right so when a read happens it'll go and get the chunks from separate storage backends combine it on the proxy and give it back to the client so what have I said? Native HTTP, Swift scales linearly, scales sideways. There is no shared metadata. There is no shared state in the clusters. As far as your DNS and load balancers do their job correctly, we do scale sideways forever. Uh, no single point of failure in your deployment, as long as it's not introduced artificially. If you have a single load balancer, that's your single point of failure. If you have a single node with all your account container databases in it, because you designed the system to do that, could be, right? But it correctly designed system, there's no single point of failure anywhere. Standard servers, free Linux, extremely durable storage system. I mentioned earlier 12 nines has been reached by the people that knows how to calculate that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so since no single point of failure, we are you know, resilient to hardware failures. Swift proxy, since that is the contact with a client, knows how to route around failed drives, failed nodes, failed racks, and the consistency model with uh, eventual consistency, right, uh, facilitates a cluster spanning data centers and geographic far, far apart regions with very high uh, latency, low bandwidth uh, sections of a single cluster. So once again, we don't replicate between clusters when we say a global cluster. It's the regions inside of a cluster that makes up your data centers. The soft layer wrote a FTP to Swift translation in memory process. So if you want to, you can deploy that software on every single proxy, speak a FTP to it, and it will on the back end translate into Swift to service the request.
it's application aware storage. So if your application wants to compress the object, give, give me a compressed object and I will store it compressed for you. Good. Let's eat. <laughs>